The Deanopidae spider has an unusual method of catching prey. A member of the Cribolot family of arachnids, the Deanopidae has thousands of very tiny silk-spurting spigots, rather than two, four, six, or eight, as is more typical among other spider families. This spigot system means the silk that is woven by this spider has a frizzy, wooly texture, and the strands are so small and so many that any prey is easily entangled without the silk needing to have any added glue for stickiness. What makes the Deanopidae unusual even among its frizzy silked brethren, however, is that instead of weaving a large web and then crawling around on it waiting for prey to come to it, it instead lays in wait, hidden in the shadows or hunting at night, so that its two oversized eyes, which dwarf the other six smaller, normal spider eyes, can help it see prey, while the prey cannot see it. It then weaves a net out of silk and holds that net out in front of its head and pounces on the unfortunate insect or other invertebrate and then wraps it up, entangling the poor thing and earning the Deanepity spider the nickname Net Casting Spider. Humans, of course, have also made good use of nets throughout history for many purposes, but capturing game very much among them, especially at first, way back in the day. There's evidence that hunters were using nets during the Upper Paleolithic era, between 30,000 and 22,000 years ago in Europe, during a period called the Grivetian. This period was defined by the extreme cold and the culture that survived the environment only made it work by hunting a whole lot of game. And this required somewhat complex tools and strategies for hunting. Included among these tools were nets that allowed them to capture small game. We still use nets for hunting today, of course, and in many places around the world, the nets that we use are made in a very traditional way and are constructed in a very traditional style. The cast net is a type of net that you've probably seen in photographs, even if you've never seen it used in person. This is a net that you typically throw from a boat into the water, and along the rim of this very large net are weights lined up so that they pull the net downward evenly. Once the net has settled near the bottom of the sea or lagoon or river, a second rope attached to the net is pulled, and this rope pulls the weighted rim of the net together, which captures any fish who might have been caught under the initial descent of that net, and encloses them inside. This net, which is now enclosed, is then pulled in, and the fishermen are able to put food on the table or money in their pockets if they sell those fish. Again, this style of net is still being used all around the world. I've seen it personally a few times in rural parts of Southeast Asia in particular, but it's used in many places around the world, not just Asia. But it's also quite a traditional type of net. This style of net, the cast net, was mentioned in the New Testament and was the weapon of choice for Raoun which was a mythical Norse sea giantess who used a cast net to ensnare lost sailors. It was also used by a type of gladiator in ancient Rome called a retiarius, who was kind of a satirical sailor character in the gladiator pits who was armed with a cast net and a trident. And the retiarius was typically made to fight a more traditionally armed and heavily armored opponent called a secutor. Nets 
today are used for all kinds of purposes, from fishing to hunting to shipping, and they've even seen use by the military. Ships called net-laying ships, or boom defense vehicles in the British parlance, were used to stretch nets around likely swaths of ocean, like bays or harbors, or around individual ships to defend against submarines and torpedoes during World War II. Seventy-seven net-laying ships were deployed during the war, though all of these ships are now defunct, rendered obsolete by modern underwater detection technologies. It's a net maker that is at the center of the story that I want to unspool today. And though the bigger topic isn't about nets at all, like nets, it taps into something that stretches far back in human history, and which will likely continue to be a focus for our species for the foreseeable future. And that topic is the pursuit of frontiers. You are listening to Let's Know Things. I'm Colin Wright. Let's Know Things is brought to you by its wonderful listeners. If you go to letsnotethings.com, you will find an assortment of contribution options if you are enjoying the show. Everything from contributing a dollar an episode, to leaving a review on iTunes, to buying one of my books or checking out our sponsors. Thank you so much to everyone who has already contributed in some way, and thank you in advance if you are considering doing so in the future. Speaking of sponsors, this episode is brought to you by Audible. If you have not yet given it a shot, you can check out Audible for a month and receive a free audiobook from their library of your choice, which is yours to keep whether or not you stick with them past that month free trial. Go to audibletrial.com slash LKT. It helps support the show, but it also gives you the chance to taste test the audiobook thing before committing to it. And if you don't have a book in mind to spend that credit on already, stay tuned till the end of the episode and I will give a book recommendation. This episode is also brought to you by HostGator. HostGator is my hosting company of choice that I use to host all of my online properties, including letsnotethings.com. If you are planning on building a website, an online portfolio, or just want to have a domain of your own to call your online home, pop over to hostgator.com LKT for a special discount that they provide to listeners of Let's Know Things, hostgator.com LKT. All right, let's get back to the show. The article that I want to start from today comes from BBC, and it's entitled Japan Tests Innovative Magnetic Tether for Slowing Space Junk. In the article, they talk about a ship that has been launched by the Japanese called the Stork, or that's the translation at least. The ship is called the Konatori in Japanese. And this ship, in addition to being a cargo vessel, will trail behind it a half-mile-long tether made of aluminum strands and steel wire, which is intended to slow and hopefully destroy bits of space junk that it comes into contact with. This very long tether is lubricated and is electrodynamic, and it will apparently generate enough energy so that when it comes into contact with space junk, it will change the orbit of that junk, which should hopefully push the unwanted objects down toward the Earth's atmosphere, where it will burn up. And interestingly, this tether was made with the assistance of a 106-year-old fishing net company in Japan called Nito Saimo Ko. The article also briefly touches on a few other theorized options for dealing with space junk, 
But the reality is that we don't actually have any means of addressing this growing problem at the moment. Nothing that's been put into practice, at least. And as problems go, this is one that has the potential to become a fairly devastating issue in the coming years. Now, to understand why, we have to do a quick introduction to so-called space debris. And space debris is made up of old satellites and pieces of rockets and chunks of other evidence of human passing, including pieces of junk that are the result of junk hitting junk, which in turn makes more smaller pieces of junk. And each collision then results in smaller and smaller bits. And this is an issue because even the smallest piece of space junk is like a bullet. In space, there's no air, there's no friction to slow anything that is moving down. So these pieces tend to move at very, very high rates, up to 17,500 miles per hour. And for comparison, to put that in perspective, the average bullet moves at around 1,700 miles per hour. So this space junk is actually moving over 10 times the speed of a bullet, which is why it is so potentially dangerous. This is especially disconcerting when you consider how many of these bits are out there orbiting the Earth. As of 2013, there were more than 170 million pieces of junk, about a centimeter, that's about 0.4 inches in diameter, about 670,000 that are between 1 and 10 centimeters, which is 0.4 to 4 inches, and 20 to 30,000 that are softball sized or larger. Now, some of these pieces are being actively tracked by the United States Strategic Command, which is the U.S. military wing that's in charge of things like hacking and missile defense and combating weapons of mass destruction and intelligence operations and surveillance and reconnaissance, the U.S. nuclear arsenal, and yes, space operations. And as of mid-2016, there were almost 18,000 artificial objects, because there are both human-made and just little meteorite bits objects that are considered space debris orbiting the planet. So 18,000 artificial objects are being tracked in orbit around Earth. A little over 1,400 of that 18,000 are operational satellites, while the other 16,600 are essentially space bullets that might destroy our stuff. It's worth noting that these pieces of space debris are not generally dangerous to those of us here on the ground. These swirling bits of paint flakes from rockets and lumps of frozen coolant from satellites and even the satellites themselves don't really stand much of a chance of surviving re-entry through the atmosphere intact. They would burn up before they hit the ground, probably. The friction of passing through the atmosphere from space at those speeds burns up just about everything, which is part of why our planet is not pockmarked by impact craters like the moon is. Our atmosphere protects us from cosmic rays and a bunch of other types of radiation, and most asteroids and even our own space garbage. But this muck is immensely dangerous to anyone and anything in orbit around the planet, outside of the atmosphere. And that includes those who are attempting to take off, and anyone we send up to the International Space Station, and any future missions we might have to Mars or Venus or wherever. And this is why the magnetic tether device from Japan and the other proposed devices for collecting junk of this kind are so vital. Even though space is a big place, and even though the chances of colliding with a bit of space junk is currently not super high, at least not a devastating impact with space junk is not super high, this is an increasing problem that, if allowed to continue unabated, might result in what is called the Kessler syndrome. 
The Kessler syndrome was a situation proposed by a NASA scientist named Donald J. Kessler back in 1978, and a very low-grade example of it was shown in the 2013 movie Gravity. Kessler posited that should the density of low Earth orbit debris reach a critical point, the collisions between these objects could cause an exponential cascading effect, which means essentially one piece hits another, resulting in five new smaller pieces, each of which hit another five pieces, which results in 30 pieces, each of which hits another 30 pieces, which results in another 900, and so on. This cascade could create a cloud of tiny and not-so-tiny chunks of garbage around the planet that would destroy all of our satellites and make launching new ones either impossible or improbable. One consequence of this would be several generations of Earthlings going without satellites of any kind, which would mean no GPS and a substantial decrease in internet and mobile phone bandwidth. All of the work currently done by communication satellite arrays would be redirected to undersea cables and earthbound cellular towers, which would clog the pipes, which would in turn stop or make sludge-like our existing communication channels. Those living in remote areas would lose all communication with the outside world. Those who watch TV via satellite would be out of luck. Airplanes use GPS to navigate, as do other fundamental shipping and travel conduits. The slow or ceased internet would have immense consequences beyond just browsing an email. Consider that much of our financial transaction infrastructure and our credit cards and ATMs and our international banking and money markets, our military capabilities and communications, these all rely to greater or lesser degrees on satellites. Our modern economies and politics and militaries and entertainments and communications of all shapes and sizes run through these channels or depend on the technologies that they allow. Much of what we know about the world, from hard science to the consequences of that science, like hurricane predictions and climate mapping, are the results of satellites. Some of these channels would continue to exist in some ground-based form, but all would be crippled. It would take decades to repair the damage. And what we'd have at the end of those repairs, of rebuilding the infrastructure on the ground, would still be a sad shadow of what we enjoy today. That means perhaps several generations of people growing up not knowing what fast internet or GPS or satellite images are like. It would also mean decades of no space travel, no exploration beyond our atmospheric shores. On that last point, I'm going to guess that there will be at least a few people listening to this who think, well, good. Why are we wasting our time up there anyway, when there's so much to be done down here on Earth? Could that money not be better spent on other things? I'll be honest, I was gobsmacked the first time someone said this to me, but they weren't alone in their opinion. I think many people feel that the exploration of space is a waste of time, or even harmful, because it utilizes talent and man hours and resources that we could be spending on more practical, fundamental, ground level issues here on Earth. Why spend billions on spacecraft that are meant to die on other planets, they wonder, when we could spend that same money here on Earth trying to preserve rainforests or feed the hungry? Why suck up all that engineering talent to build space lasers when those same bright souls could be building better geothermal wells or coming up with ways to improve our roads? And this argument actually makes sense, I think, in a very limited way. Every single facet of the universe that we choose to pursue comes with opportunity costs in the shape of all other facets that we could be pursuing instead. When we choose to do research to cure cancer, we are not doing research with those people and resources to cure Zika. When we're building spaceships, we are not building hospitals. 
But this argument fails to account for the many valuable consequences of space exploration, including and especially those that benefit the Earth-bound humans, not just those who hope to someday amble around in zero gravity. There's the international collaboration angle of space exploration. Research in space, from low Earth orbit out to other planets, has been an international effort from the very beginning. A great deal of the early work was done by the United States and the now-defunct Soviet Union. But even during the Cold War era, there was work being done all around the world, and that work was very seldom, if ever, done in isolation. And arguably, none of it was done by just one nation, since the knowledge required to get up there and start researching to begin with was attained by people from all over the world even in the cases when it was done on the tab of a single nation for the infrastructural benefit of a single nation. In recent years, though, the internationality of space-based work has gone up a notch as more nations have realized the direct technological, cultural, and economic benefits of being involved. There are currently about 70 different government-backed space agencies in the world, and 13 of those agencies are capable of launching their own rockets. Six of those 13 are currently capable of launching their own satellites and operating their own probes from the ground. And two of those six are currently, as I record this anyway, capable of human spaceflight. And those are China and Russia. The United States is currently making use of other methods of human space flight launches, typically using Russian infrastructure. And that speaks volumes about how important such programs can be, because even when nations are butting heads on every other level, like the US and Russia currently are, as I record this, the work done through such programs continues unabated, and the personalities involved in these programs work hand in hand. This has been the case since modern space research began to take shape. And it will hopefully continue to be the case as private companies start to take on or even take over some of the responsibilities typically upheld by government entities in the past. There's also the economic argument for space research and space exploration. NASA, which is the United States Space Exploration Organization, publishes its budget every year, and I'll, I'll link to its budget and a few other documents that it publishes each year in the show notes. And according to the budget of 2016, NASA employs 17,515 people and has a budget of $19.3 billion. Now, the majority of that, $10.1 billion, goes directly into research and engineering and development. $7.8 billion little less than a half of that budget goes into operations. Almost $1 billion is granted to other entities by NASA who serve the same ends or contribute in some way to their research or toward technologies that they want to see developed. And about a half billion goes to maintaining and upgrading their facilities and equipment. Now, the economic benefits of NASA and other organizations are incredibly difficult to quantify because it touches on so many different sectors. To understand why and to get an idea of the size and the overwhelming scope of their impact, let's talk for a moment about the technological benefits of space programs. Another thing that I will link to in the show notes is what's called NASA spin-offs. And this is another report that they put out each year, and it essentially covers the technologies, the consumer-based or B2B, business-to-business-based technologies and systems that have resulted from NASA's research. So anything that is derived from research that they have done, that is space-based research that then becomes something that is not so space-based, that is documented in this publication that they put out so that they can show essentially politicians and the public that this is something that is not just about rocket ships and lasers. Now let's get something out of the way. First and foremost, space pens were not developed by NASA, and that old story about NASA spending tons of money on the space pen while the Soviets just used a pencil is fake. 
plus using a pencil in space would be ill-advised as the bits of wood and graphite would get into the equipment. Also not developed by NASA, though a lot of people seem to think that it was, is Tang. Tang was used in some early orbit missions, but it was developed by General Mills. Also not developed by NASA was Velcro. That was invented by the Swiss in the 1940s. That said, there are numerous technologies that have either been direct spin-offs of research and development done by NASA, or that were informed directly by the knowledge attained by the program. And a very brief list of these things include ear thermometers, artificial limbs, invisible braces, scratch-resistant lenses, the space blanket, the anti-icing systems you find on airplanes, improved radial tires for your car, methods of chemical detection, video enhancing and analysis systems, fire-resistant technologies, devices that keep patients alive while waiting for heart transplants, LED-based cancer treatments, those annoying but effective safety grooves that you find on highways, the face masks, frames, harnesses, radios, and air bottles that firefighters use, the temper foam used in pillows and mattresses, not to mention its use in aircraft, and amusement park rides and horse saddles and prostheses for humans and animals, enriched baby food. This enrichment proved to be so beneficial, by the way, that it's now found in over 90% of infant formulas found in the U.S. Portable cordless vacuum cleaners, the freeze-drying of food, those new swimsuits that are being used by Olympians, which have already been used to break 13 world records, the digital image sensors that are found in digital cameras and GoPros and smartphones, water purification systems, the solar cells that are used in solar panels, the substance used to clean petroleum from water after oil spills, GPS technologies, structural analysis software that allows us to build structurally sound buildings before actually building anything, powdered lubricants used in industry, ultrasonic bolt elongation monitors, which are used to keep mines safe for miners, and various food safety programs and methodologies. Again, that is just a quick, incomplete overview of the most prominent spinoffs from NASA alone not inclusive of other space programs around the world and their impact on myriad technologies and industries. Quantifying the impact that any single one of these developments have had would be difficult. Like how would you put a number on the value of the digital image sensors that are used in every single digital camera, smartphone, and video camera embedded in any device today, for instance? And trying to put a number on all of these things combined is the activity of a crazy person. It would be too insane to even try, I think. And think about the scale of that impact and compare it to the price tag. $19.3 billion. That is how much we spent on NASA as a country in 2016. We spent $10 billion a day during the war in Iraq. I know war and research are not directly comparable things, but it's worth having that numerical comparison in mind, especially when we're looking at things in terms of a cost-benefit analysis. NASA looks pretty damn good from that perspective, in my opinion, and that's not even considering the bigger, broader benefits of the program. One such big, broad benefit is the potential for development of tools and methods that allow for our long-term survival as a species. This could mean deflecting or detonating a rogue asteroid that is going to impact with Earth. It could mean collecting the data required to show the impact of climate change and then giving us information that we will need to counteract the problems that we will be facing as a result of that shift. It also means giving us the tools and knowledge required to eventually expand our reach beyond just one planet, out onto other planets, onto space stations, and any other place that we might be able to survive and flourish. Many people, myself included, see this expansion of the species 
as a vital prerogative, because without it, all of our eggs are kind of in one basket. And this basket is a friendly one, compared to most of the other heavenly bodies that we have looked at. But it's also a tumultuous one that's changing rapidly, and which is one big gravity well that is always tugging at space stuff that could plow into us and end all life on the surface with very little warning. So it's very worth diversifying a little bit. And space programs will hopefully eventually give us that opportunity, even if not as immediately as some of us might prefer. Another difficult to quantify benefit of space programs is the perspective that they grant us. Very, very valuable perspective. The famous blue marble photograph of the planet that was taken by the crew of the Apollo 17 spacecraft in 1972 is one such valuable artifact. And I'll, I'll link to this in the show notes. I almost guarantee you've seen this photo at some point, though. It's a complete photo of the planet Earth with beautiful blues and browns and greens and a nice swirl of clouds. And you can see Antarctica down at the bottom. It's distinctive. It's one of the most distributed and reproduced images in history. And this wasn't the first full Earth photograph taken from space, but it became distinctive because it evoked a feeling of vulnerability. It showed our planet as something lush and gorgeous and life-giving, but also as something incredibly frail in the context of space as a whole. Everything we'd ever known, everything that has ever mattered to any of us, as a species, as individuals, as nations, was just one small part of this one small marble hanging out there in space in a perhaps infinite, very cold, somewhat empty void. And compared to that, compared to the immensity of this void, of this larger space that we were such a minuscule part of, all of our concerns, all of our histories, all of our beliefs and adventures and goals were just so tiny. This perspective is humbling and it's useful. It allows us to understand the grander context that we are a part of, while also making our worldly concerns seem a little more achievable and our problems a little more solvable. Anything that would have seemed like the end of the world before is brought swiftly down to earth, you might say. Working on these grand scales, whether in space or whether by discovering exotic particles that explain something about the universe in which our planet exists, grants us a God's eye view that helps us make better decisions and helps us be more aware of the big picture, and sometimes on a very microscopic quantum level. That awareness, of course, also helps us to suss out the big questions that we have always asked and will continue to ask. Why are we here? What should we be doing with our lives? What's the purpose of it all? Is there something out there that created us, or can we explain our existence through other means? There will always be more questions like this, and for every one that we answer, we will discover that there are three more that we hadn't thought to ask before. But it's the asking and the pursuit of more information that itself is the valuable part of these questions. And the exploration of frontiers is what helps inform each of us as individuals, but also the totality of our species, so that we can round out whichever answers we determine to be the correct ones based on our increasing perspective and fleshed out understanding of context. And then one final benefit of space exploration to mention is that it helps us feed our relentless and seemingly genetic predisposition toward discovering and conquering frontiers. We push outward into the unknown in an attempt to make it more familiar and comprehensible. We, as a species, 
like to shine light into the dark areas of our existence so that we might get a better view of ourselves and everything else. And that last point, I think, is important and, again, difficult to quantify. Perhaps the most difficult to quantify of all the things I've addressed so far in this episode. It's relatively easy to show the monetary benefits of investing in space exploration, but it's far trickier to show, numerically, how the discovery, exploration, and eventual normalization of frontiers of any kind is key to a happy, healthy human species. Now, a frontier is anything that is near or just beyond a current boundary. And this could be a boundary of any kind. This can apply to politics or geography or knowledge or understanding. It refers to anything that we know about but don't know well. In the U.S., the western half of the continent was our frontier for a time. Any story you've ever heard about the Wild West in the U.S. during the latter half of the 19th century, that took place in the American frontier. To expound on that example, there were already European settlements in the U.S. frontier as early as the 18th century, and the last of the continental U.S. states were added in 1912. But for a while, this area was known, and there were people there, people in the culture doing the recording and rhapsodizing, that is, because, of course, there were already people in that area who were having their land taken from them and were being colonized by outsiders. So let's say there were new settlers there expanding the U.S. borders, but they weren't really an extension of the culture that existed in the East as much as seeds that were planted for that culture to expand there in the future. They were laying railroad tracks and blasting mines and planting crops and building rickety homes to live in. The whole ideology and mythology of the cowboy stems from this time period, and though much of it is hugely romanticized and blown out of proportion and way beyond the scope of reality, that caricature of a character relied on untamed wilderness and the foothold of so-called civilization in an otherwise uncivilized, hostile environment. These cowboys were who they were because they were hardscrabble, heroic, bruised but not beaten individuals who plowed fields out of wasted landscapes and constructed society brick by brick in a time and place where scalpings were a thing that happened and the only reliable means of law enforcement was gathering together a militia made up of local cowboys. It's safe to say that throughout history, a lot of frontiers, as perceived by one group, were actually familiar, well-paved, or whatever that metaphorically meant for the region, territory for another. The United States frontier was the Native Americans' familiar home just as the Angolan frontier for the Portuguese had actually been the familiar home of the locals since some time back in the Paleolithic era. What is and isn't a frontier when it comes to the writing of history books is typically denoted by those who write the books. Interestingly, and importantly, I think, the difference between a frontier and a border is that the former is the space right on the edge of current knowledge and understanding and control, while the latter is a fixed, unyielding delineation. I think this is an important distinction intellectually, because it allows us to understand what we perceive to be rigid and unbreakable, and what we believe we're on the cusp of overcoming and understanding. We call the divisions between countries borders because we intend for them to be respected and don't want someone on the other side to slowly expand into our space over time, influencing or occupying it away from our control. We refer to new fields of science that we've done some research on but still don't fully grasp as frontiers, the frontiers of human knowledge, because this implies we intend to keep studying, to keep planting seeds, to someday occupy this space of knowledge in a way that 
civilizes it and allows us to turn it into technology. We intend to plant our flag there and make it ours. But a question worth asking, I think, is in regard to the negative consequences of pursuing and conquering frontiers. I don't find the question of whether it's worthwhile to pursue frontiers particularly compelling because of the reasons I mentioned before and because it does seem to be some part of human nature to chase horizons, even knowing that each one crested will just reveal a new set of horizons we will then have to chase. Instead, I would ask, how might we ameliorate the destruction that we leave in our wake when we explore frontiers and put down roots in them. This applies to situations in which one group's frontier is the familiar home of another group, as was the case around the world during Europe's age of discovery and in the U.S. as the government extended its reach westward. But it's also a possible issue as we expand outward into space toward other planets which may already be inhabited, if not by little green men or Roswell greys, then by bacteria or other microscopic organisms that would almost certainly be negatively impacted or even destroyed by our arrival and entrenchment. This is something that space organizations are already taking very seriously, and they are doing what they can to scrub their machines clean of Earth-born organisms before shooting them out toward new homes elsewhere in the solar system. But there's still some concern that when we finally start setting up our condos and coffee shops on Mars, the locals will have already been killed off by our germs. This is something we've already experienced many times in Western culture, by the way, and it warrants further preparation, I think, if we want to avoid being a species that arrives with plagues as our heralds even as we go off-planet. It's also worth noting that expansion into a frontier needn't and probably shouldn't result in an exact replica of what's familiar back home just in a new location. A lot of the issues that the Western states in the U.S. are facing are at least partially the result of habits and traditions brought over from the East Coast. Having bright green lawns around one's house, for instance, is something that made a sort of traditional cultural sense in New England back in the day, since they were doing their best to replicate the tastes and priorities of the English nobility, to have a well-trimmed lawn that they didn't have to grow food on was a sign of luxury and wealth, and their weather in the East allowed for such lawns to exist without too much trouble. In the West, though, maintaining similar lawns require a massive quantity of water and other resources in deserts in a lot of cases, which in turn makes those resources unavailable for other things like, say, drinking or crops that actually feed people. What's happening in space right now is another manifestation of this. When new property opens up, we fill it with infrastructure. This has benefited us in many ways, just as electrical cables and fiber optics have done down on Earth. But if we are going to continue moving outward and going to eventually live out there beyond the atmosphere, we'll need to rethink how we utilize such infrastructure and how we clean up after ourselves in an environment in which bits of trash are actually super bullets and anything we discard becomes not just unsightly, but potentially immensely dangerous. This episode of Let's Know Things and every episode of Let's Know Things is brought to you by its wonderful listeners. If you are enjoying the show, consider stopping by letsknowthings.com and clicking on the contribute page and either contributing monetarily directly using one of the links there or clicking through and leaving a review on iTunes or elsewhere or sharing the show with a friend. All of these things help immensely and I very much appreciate any and all contributions. Another good way to help support the show is to purchase one of my books. You can find a full list of the books that I've written at colin.io. And another good way to help support the show is to check out our sponsors. And the sponsors for today's episode include 
Audible. Audible is just an amazing service for people like me who are in love with reading. If you are like I was at one point, not fully convinced by the audiobook thing, but willing to give it a shot, stop by audibletrial.com slash LKT and you will receive a free month trial of Audible and a free audiobook of your choice, any book from their collection that is yours to keep, whether or not you stick with them past that free month. This is a great way to check out the audiobook thing and also support the show. If you do not have a book in mind to use that credit on, might I suggest The Peace War by Werner Vinge. Werner Vinge is one of my favorite science fiction authors. He has written some amazing work. A Fire Upon the Deep is probably his most famous work. But I recently read a book by him called The Peace War, which was very interesting, very compelling. The concept is essentially that a research facility develops a device that creates essentially bubbles of space-time, bubbles that are completely impenetrable and seal off whatever is inside from the rest of the world. The scientists who develop this technology use it to take over the planet, essentially. And I, I don't want to give away too much more because it will ruin some of the plot points, but it is a very interesting story. It's an intriguing look into what can happen when a certain technology that at first glance might seem useless or even worse than useless, perhaps just harmful, how it could actually be utilized for political gain, for military gain, and for just overall gain in a way that could potentially result in a worse global situation than we already have. That is the Peace War by Werner Vinge, and I will link to that in the show notes if you are interested in clicking through and checking it out. You can use that Audible credit to get The Peace War, or you can just pick it up at your local library, your local indie bookstore, grab it on your Kindle or your Kobo, whatever is most convenient for you. This episode is also brought to you by HostGator. HostGator is the hosting company that I've been using for years. I host all of my properties from Let's Note Things to my blog, Exile Lifestyle, to my author page, Colin.io, using HostGator. They have excellent prices, excellent service, very easy to use control panels, lots of beginner level tools, but lots of pro level stuff as well. And if you go to hostgator.com slash LKT, you will receive a special discount for listeners of Let's Note Things. That is hostgator.com slash LKT. You can find out more about me and the work that I've done, including the books that I've written at colin.io. You can read my essays at exilelifestyle.com. You can find Let's Know Things on Instagram and Facebook and Twitter at Let's Know Things. And you can find me pretty much everywhere on the internet at Colin is my name. Thank you so very much for listening. I'm Colin Wright, and I will talk to you again next week. Thank you.